Today we have this really cool log integral characterized by a parameter s and the restriction on the parameter is that it should be greater than one. That's what we need for the integral to converge. So for reference purposes, let's call this i sub s and how exactly should we approach this problem? Well, a good strategy would be to define an integral function i of some parameter a as the integral from zero to infinity of x to the a divided by one plus x to the s dx. And how exactly does this help our cause? Well, if you differentiate i with respect to the parameter a, then by the Leibniz rule, you have the integral from zero to infinity of the partial derivative with respect to a of x to the a divided by one plus x to the s dx. And because we're differentiating partially with respect to a, all those functions not of a are just constants. So we have one by one plus x to the s times the partial derivative with respect to a of x to the a. And this partial derivative sorts out to x to the a times log x, which recovers the numerator we need for the target case. Okay, cool. So this implies that the derivative of i with respect to a equals the integral from zero to infinity of x to the a times log x divided by one plus x to the s dx. So our target case here is that of a being equal to zero. If we evaluate the derivative at a equal to zero, we get the integral from zero to infinity of log x dx divided by one plus x to the s. And this here is our target integral i sub s. So that's our plan. We're gonna evaluate i of a and then differentiate the result with respect to a and plug in the target case of a equal to zero. But first, how exactly do we evaluate the integral function? Well, for that, I'm gonna make a substitution. We're gonna let x to the s equal u. And this implies that x equals u to the one by s, which further implies that dx equals one by s times u to the one by s minus one du. And the limits of integration are not bothered by our transformation. So this implies that i of a in the u world is the integral from zero to infinity of x to the a turns into u to the a by s and the differential element transforms into this one by s factor outside u to the one by s minus one du divided by one plus u. And just multiplying out the terms in the numerator, we get one by s times the integral from zero to infinity of u to the a plus one by s minus one du divided by one plus u. And this integral here is related to the gamma function by virtue of the integral representation of the reflection formula that I'm gonna derive real quick using the second integral representation of the beta function. Now the beta function with complex arguments x and y is defined as the integral from zero to infinity of u to the x minus one divided by one plus u to the x plus y du. Okay, cool. So if we have x plus y equal to one, which implies the y here equals one minus x, this implies that the integral you have, that is the integral from zero to infinity, of u to the x minus one divided by one plus u because x plus y is equal to one, du equals the beta function evaluated at x and one minus x. And using the relation between the beta function and the gamma function, we have gamma x times gamma one minus x divided by gamma x plus one minus x and the x terms just cancel out. We're left with gamma one, which is one. And this here is the structure required for the reflection formula where we know that gamma x times gamma one minus x equals pi times the cosecant of pi x. So invoking this formula, this integral representation for the reflection formula that is to our target integral i of a, and that means we have one by s times the gamma function evaluated at a plus one by s times gamma one minus a plus one by s. So now that we know what our integral function evaluates out to using the reflection formula, we have one by s times pi times the cosecant 
of this argument, pi times this argument, that is. So that's pi by s times a plus pi by s. And remember what our target case was. We wanted to differentiate the integral function with respect to the parameter a. So this implies on differentiation that we have i of a, i prime of a, that is, equal to pi by s times the derivative of the cosecant is a negative cosecant times a cotangent. So we have pi by s times a plus pi by s times the cotangent of pi by s times a plus pi by s. And because of the chain rule, we also have to differentiate this function of a here, which gives us another pi by s term. So we have pi squared by s squared times the cosecant and cotangent. And our target integral, i sub s, was in fact the derivative evaluated at a equal to zero. So that means we have negative pi squared by s squared times the cosecant of pi by s times the cotangent of pi by s, which itself is a pretty cool result, but let's plug in some values to see what we can generate. We know the parameter needs to be greater than one, so let's start off simple by i sub two. So that gives us negative pi squared by four times the cosecant of pi by two, which is one, and the cotangent of pi by two, which is zero, which means that the integral is zero. And this is correct because the integral from zero to infinity of log x divided by one plus x squared dx, which is i sub two, can be verified equals to zero using a transformation from the x world to the one by x world. And under this transformation, you'll find that the integral equals its own negative, which means it's zero. And the case of i sub three is an integral evaluated by Michael Penn a long while back. That's gonna be negative pi squared by nine times the cosecant of pi by three times the cotangent of pi by three. So what exactly is the cosecant of pi by three? That's the reciprocal of sine pi by three. So that's gonna be two by root three. And what about cotangent pi by three? That should be one by root three and negative pi squared by nine. So you have three in the denominator, two by three here, which implies that I sub three should be equal to negative two pi squared by 27, which agrees with Penn's result. So yeah, the formula is working. The generalized integration result is working. So let's plug in some funky numbers, some irrational numbers to get some cool looking results. For example, what if I go for i of pi? This is the integral from zero to infinity of log x divided by one plus x to the pi dx, which itself looks pretty cool. And this would give us a negative pi squared by pi squared, which is of course negative one, times the cosecant of one times the cotangent of one. And the cosecant is one by sine, cotangent is cosine by sine. So you have negative cosine one divided by the square of sine of one, which is again, a nice little party trick result. And I think the most aesthetically pleasing result would be plugging in either the golden ratio or the euler mascheroni constant. In that case, you have the integral from zero to infinity of log x divided by one plus x to the phi dx equal to negative pi squared by phi squared times the cotangent of pi by phi times the cosecant of pi by phi which does look really cool indeed. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you, see you next time.